Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Fresh Vision Church here in El Paso, Texas. Again, I just want to thank you for taking the time to check out this video on Facebook or on YouTube. If you have any comments or questions, um, please feel free to leave them um, in the comment section, either on Facebook or on YouTube. Also, if you want to know more about us, you can check us out on our website at fvcelp.org. And there you can find all the information about our church, our mission statement, our statement of faith, um, a little bit about, a little bit short bio about me, things that we're doing, past sermons, um, you can find it all there. Also, if you have any prayer requests or praise reports or you just want to leave, uh, again, just a message, you can also do that by going to our website. There, in the bottom of our webpage, you'll find a message area where you can send us all that information. Also, if you're in the El Paso area, we'd like to invite you to come check us out sometime. Right now, we're having one service at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. We do also have a youth night, which is on Thursday nights at 6 p.m. And if you want more information on that, you can, um, again, you can go to our website and you'll find the information there. Again, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day or evening whenever you're watching this video to, uh, to check us out. And I hope that you're blessed after hearing this message. Thank you, and we'll go ahead and begin with today's message. In this chapter that we're about to begin, Luke recorded lessons that Jesus had given his disciples about some of the essentials of the Christian life. This week, we're going to be looking at two of those essential lessons, forgiveness and faithfulness. Uh, Lord willing, when we end this chapter next week, we'll be covering a couple more lessons, thankfulness and preparedness. So, for those of you that consider yourselves mature in the faith, um, you consider yourselves servants of Christ, this morning's message will show you these truths about faith. Faith never tempts another person to sin. Faith forgives one who does sin. Faith asks God for miracles. And faith always sees oneself as a duty-bound slave or servant. So before we get into God's Word, let's ask Him to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, thank You for this day and thank You for giving us this opportunity to hear from You, from Your Word. I pray that You bless those that um, are watching this message or hearing it online, Lord. I pray that it goes out powerfully and that You will speak to them clearly. I also pray that you give those that are listening soft hearts, Lord. I pray that you will give them ears to hear and eyes to see. Lord, use me as your instrument to speak your truth, speak it powerfully and unashamedly, Lord. So I pray that you will remove all distractions so that our focus may be totally and completely on you, Lord. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verse 1. And the Word of God says, He said to His disciples, Offenses will certainly come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. I'll stop there for a minute and break down what we just read. Well, to prepare his disciples for the ministry that they'll be undertaking for him, Jesus warns them about stumbling blocks that may cause them or other believers to sin. So he begins by informing them that these stumbling blocks or offenses are inevitable. You see, the path they were following him on led straight to Jerusalem, to the cross, and then eventually out into a hostile world. So he wanted them to be aware that their lives on that path wouldn't be one of pious isolation but rather it would be a path where they would have to regularly interact with the people of this world. 
The disciples therefore needed to have a strong understanding about the reality of sin and the nature of people. The reality of sin is that it'll never go away. Such things will certainly come. And the reality is that it's an unfortunate part of reality in this world that can't be avoided. And this is the nature of people. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What this means is that everyone, believers and non-believers, we're all going to be tempted to sin. And many times, yes, even the most strongest Christian will succumb. You see, as long as we're in these bodies, as long as we're in this flesh, as long as we're in these temporary tents of ours, we're going to blow it. We're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to sin. And many times in that process of, of sinning, others are going to be hurt and are going to be affected by that sin. It's therefore important that when you do sin, that you're able to recognize it and you're able to see it and be convicted of it, repent of it, and ask forgiveness from God and also from the person that you offended. By doing that, it shows that you really are maturing in the faith. Because nowadays we live in a world where People are often told that asking for forgiveness is a sign of weakness, and it should never be done. As the passage continues, Jesus warns them, his disciples, about the dangers of stumbling another, and then also just to remain alert. But he begins with a strong language of grief and mourning to express his woe to the one who is an agent of temptation who causes someone else to sin. What Jesus is essentially saying here is that people are going to take the bait, but woe to you if you're the one that offers the hook. Or people are going to trip up, but woe to you if you're the one that sets up that stumbling block for that person to trip. Now, at the end of verse 2, the Lord states who he specifically has in mind. These little ones. Here, he's not only referring to children, but also to young believers who were young in the faith and learning how to follow the Lord. Now, just to give you a few examples of how someone can cause one of these little ones to, to stumble, I've just come up with a few. You can cause a little one to stumble by promising them that following Christ will lead to lives of health and wealth. They can be stumbled by being encouraged in worldliness and being involved in sexual sin. Young believers can be stumbled by any teaching that waters down the plain meaning of the scriptures. So see, basically anything that leads them astray from the pathway of simple faith, of devotedness, and of holiness is a stumbling block. Jesus then makes it clear that anyone causing the temptation or anyone causing someone else to sin, especially one of these little ones, would be better off ending their own lives in one of the worst possible ways by placing a millstone around their neck and then throwing themselves into the sea in order to drown and never be seen again. This type of death was a vivid description of not only physical death, but eternal condemnation. Now, I want to be clear about something. I'm not saying that if someone commits suicide, they're automatically condemned to hell. So without getting too much into the subject or getting off track and into this rabbit hole, the Word of God makes it clear in Revelation 21 verse 8, who will go to hell? And honestly, I don't see there suicide on that list. And furthermore, I'm not the one who condemns. God does. And for this reason, because I'm not God and I'm not the one that condemns, you will never hear me say that everyone who kills themselves will be going to hell. 
But what I am saying, and what I do know, is that if anyone does die, regardless of the manner, regardless of the way they die, without being born again, without being saved, without Jesus, God will judge them guilty and condemn them. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 18. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Now, let me also add that there's no sin big enough that God can't forgive. He will forgive every single type of sin, no matter how big or how small. It says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if, you've, if you're watching this, if you're listening to this, and you've messed up badly, you've completely blown it, you've, you've sinned, and you feel like everything's hopeless now, there's no way out of it, and, and the only answer that keeps playing over and over in your head is that it would be better off just to end your life, well, don't listen to that voice. It's the devil, and that's what he does. He, that's his goal, that's his purpose, to kill and to destroy. Don't listen to that voice. And also, if you're in that place, cry out to Jesus. Cry out to the Lord God Almighty to come and rescue you. He understands what you're going through. He knows, and he has compassion for you and He wants to show you His mercy, and He wants to show you His love. All you have to do is just allow Him. Allow Him to come in to your heart, give you the peace and the love that you've been searching for, that you've been yearning for, that, you've, that you need right now. And if you're able to, call out for help from someone that cares about you, that knows you, reach out to them and tell them what's going on. And if you think that there's no one there, that you've burned all bridges and there's no one available for you to talk to, you can call me. You can call me, my phone number is on, my, on the website and we can chat, we can pray, we can talk about what's going on. And, and I want you to know that before coming to Christ, I was in those dark places. And I also understand. So, my friend, I want you to know that you're not alone. Reach out and call me. Call somebody. But more importantly, reach out to your Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, as we get back into the passage here, he tells his disciples in the beginning of verse 3 to be on your guard or to be alert. He said this so that they may... He said this so that they may be mindful of how they exercise their responsibility to these little ones in society. They were to be protected, not exploited. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 10, we're told how this is done. The one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling him. In other words, if we genuinely love our brothers and sisters, we're not going to put a stumbling block into their lives in order to make them sin. We're going to do everything possible to avoid that from happening. That genuine love has a flip side, though. It also means confronting them when they do sin. In order to bring them back to repentance and God's forgiveness, which is what our Lord brings up next in this last portion of this paragraph. In the second part of verse 3 and in verse 4, Jesus teaches them to be prepared to rebuke and forgive those who stumble, those who sin, and repent. See, we all need to be aware that in the Christian life, offending others isn't the only thing that we need to be cautious about. Christians 
must also be aware of the danger of harboring grudges or refusing to forgive when an offending person apologizes. If a brother or sister does repent, then as more mature believers, we have an added responsibility to forgive them just as God has forgiven us. This is the essence of that part of the Lord's Prayer that says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. This means that you may have to forgive beyond, way beyond your tolerance level. And I'll be speaking a little bit more on that in, in a minute. But regarding rebukes and other disciplinary action, they're not to be used as a means to get even or to humiliate the offender or even to assert dominance. Their purpose is to restore the believer to fellowship with the Lord and with his or her Christian brothers and sisters. For this reason, all rebukes, every single one of them, should be delivered in a spirit of love. See, we have no way of judging whether an offender's repentance is genuine. Only time and their actions will prove that. But even then, from my own experience, I know that it's possible for someone to repent and not learn from their mistakes. Does this mean that we should reserve forgiveness until we actually see signs of it? No. Jesus doesn't say, wait and forgive. He says that we must forgive. This means that we must accept his or her own word that he or she has repented. Well, what if he insults me? Or what if she disrespects me? And then tells me that they're sincerely sorry and then just keeps doing it again and again, over and over. And they keep saying sorry. And I forgive them, but they do it, they do it again and again. Well, listen again to what Jesus said. If he sins against you seven times in a day and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Now, I know it says here seven times, but what this implies is it's a continual act of forgiveness. It's not just seven times. It's doing it over and over. Just as, just as often as they offend and they sin against you, you have to continually keep forgiving. Now, let's say, for example, you're in an abusive relationship. It doesn't mean that you need to stay in that relationship and keep tolerating that abuse. No, there comes a time, there comes a moment where you just need to step away and allow them to work on their relationship with God and allow yourself to work on it as well. Because the fact of the matter is, that person that's causing the abuse is putting a stumbling block before you. So again, if someone comes up to you for the hundredth time and tells you that I repent, you must forgive them. This is exactly the way our gracious Father in heaven treats us. See, no matter how often we fail him, we still have the assurance that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now in the next section that we're about to read, the Lord Jesus will give his disciples a, another lesson or maybe a couple more lessons. So if you still have your Bibles with you and they're still open, follow along as I pick up in verse 5 of chapter 17, of Luke chapter 17. And there it says, The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, the Lord said, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Which one of you? having a servant tending sheep or plowing will say to him when he comes in from the field, come at once and sit down and eat. Instead, will he not tell him, prepare something for me to eat 
get ready and serve me while I eat and drink. Later you can eat and drink. Is this, does he thank that servant because he did what was commanded? In the same way, when you have done all that you were commanded, you should say, we are worthless servants. We've only done our duty. In this section that we just read, Jesus gave his disciples an important lesson on the power of faith and to be prepared as servants to be at the master's disposal. Well, it seems or it appears that the thought of having to forgive seven times in a single day was a tough pill to swallow for the apostles. Can it really be possible to be so patient with another person? So they asked him, increase our faith, because they knew that normal human aptitudes and abilities cannot fulfill such a command. To do so required total faith in God and total dedication to God's way of life. So because they believed they didn't have enough faith to continually forgive the offenses of others, they asked Jesus for an additional supply of faith. But see, the thing is, the fact that they asked shows that they knew him as the source of all faith. And this is also something that we need to understand as well. When we think of him, we ought, we ought to see him as our source of faith. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the writer describes Jesus as the pioneer. Now, yes, some translations will say author, but he's the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Now, I looked up the word pioneer in the 1812 dictionary, and here's how it defined it. A pioneer is a person that goes before to remove obstructions or someone that goes to prepare the way for others. And if you know Jesus and you know his story, you'll know this is exactly who he is. He's a pioneer. The Greek word translated perfecter means literally completer or finisher and speaks of bringing something to its conclusion. So when you put these words together, we see that Jesus as God both creates and sustains our faith. But here's an important question. Does he give us faith or add to our faith? Well, no, not necessarily. Now the broad definition of faith is a strong belief in someone or something without logical proof. So in general, Everyone, including the most devout atheists, have faith. And they have a choice on where to place that faith. But faith in God is something completely different. And what I've learned is that faith in God has three components. Knowledge, belief, and trust. So if you're taking notes, you might want to jot this down. I'll cover each one of those just really briefly. First, in order for anyone to believe God, they must know about Him. And the only way to know about Him is through His Word. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message of Christ. The Gospel message. Second, once someone has knowledge about God, they must believe that He exists. Hebrews 11.6 says, Now without faith it's impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. And the third component of faith, and I believe it's the most important ingredient, the most important component, is trust. You see, faith is a belief system. Trust is action. Faith is believing that God is who He says He is and that what God can do, only God can do.
but trust takes it a step further. It is making the willful choice to trust that God will do what He promises. It's the head versus the heart. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely in your own understanding. Spurgeon summarized these three components of faith like this. Faith is not a blind thing, for faith begins with knowledge. It is not a speculative thing, for faith believes facts of which it is sure. It is, and it is not an unpractical, dreamy thing, for faith trusts and stakes his destiny upon the truth of revelation. That is one way of describing what faith is. Well, with that being said, as our knowledge, our belief, and trust in the Lord increases, our faith increases as well. So, although He doesn't necessarily increase our faith, He is and always will be the source of faith. And it's from that source that our faith is sustained, it's strengthened, it's encouraged. It's invigorated and faith is ignited. It helps us to see and to believe that nothing is impossible with God. And it's exactly this that leads Jesus to his next point in verse 6. The Lord replied to their request by indicating that it wasn't so much a matter of the quantity of faith, how much faith they had, but of its quality. And also, it's not a question of getting more faith, but exercising the faith they already had. The smallest imaginable amount of faith, the faith the size of a mustard seed, is enough to accomplish unimaginable miracles. So Jesus gives them an example. You can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Now, in its context, and what he's generally speaking about here, Jesus is saying that pride and self-importance will prevent a Christian from forgiving their brothers and sisters. But with a small amount of faith, that enormous pride, that pride the size of a mulberry tree, can be uprooted and cast out, making forgiveness go from the impossible to a reality. The bigger picture of this verse, though, is that it's calling mature Christians to realize the potential of their relationship with Jesus. It's a call to dependent, expectant faith. And again, the key word here is faith. You see, you must know who God is and trust Him to do the kind of things that He does in the way that He does them. The more you live within His will and ask for His will to be done, the more you'll see the marvelous things that will happen among His people in His world. So just like He did with the disciples, He wants you to know that you don't need extra faith. You don't need more faith. You need to see the faith that's already in you and exercise it. You need to understand that faith isn't something you place in a savings account that you can keep adding into until it's big enough for you to do what you want to do with it. No. Faith is an acknowledgement that regardless of how long it takes, you'll never be able to do anything on your own. However, the moment you call on God, faith is believing without a shadow of a doubt that nothing is impossible for Him. In Romans chapter 4, verses 19, 19 through 21, Paul used Abraham as an example of what this looks like. And there it says, He, speaking of Abraham, did not weaken his faith when he considered his own body to be already dead, since he was about 100 years old. And also the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to do.
Thus, if you honestly believe that God can make the impossible possible, that He can create something out of nothing, then also have the faith to believe that He knows exactly what you need to get you through any trial that seems impossible to overcome. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Well, as this passage continues in verse 7, Jesus balances one lesson with another. See, there was a danger that the twelve might get so carried away with transplanting trees that they would ignore the everyday responsibilities of life. Now, so far in the passages we've read, Jesus has been teaching his disciples that faith that doesn't result in faithfulness will not accomplish God's work. In the first six verses, he thought that it's good to have faith to do the difficult and the impossible. The lesson he teaches them here is that it's essential for a believer to have faith to do even the routine tasks the master has committed to them. And that privileges must always balance with responsibilities. So the Lord tells them to picture themselves as a landowner who has a slave or a servant who was responsible for farming, shepherding, and cooking. What he wants to know from them is what would they do when that servant comes in from the field after a long day of work, after working in the hot sun, doing those things that the master commanded him to do, would they rush to him and invite him to come at once and sit down and eat a wonderful meal that they had prepared for him? Of course not. They'd probably sit at the table and expect that servant who just came back from the field to prepare something for them to eat and then clean themselves off from the stink of the field and then serve them. And only when this part of their daily work was done could that slave expect to eat and drink something himself. Or would they rush out to the slave coming in from the field and say, oh, thank you for doing what I commanded. That's so nice of you. Yeah, no. Jesus knew that wouldn't have happened because everyone in that time and in that culture knew their role and always stayed in their lane. A master was above his slave and a slave belongs to his master and his primary duty is to obey. Well, after painting this imaginary scenario for them, the Lord snaps the disciples back into reality by driving his point home in verse 10. They are his servants and he's their master. So far, they've done all that they were commanded. They've gone out to the mission for their master. They've preached for their master. They've healed for him and they've exercised demons for him. And more importantly, they've surrendered all aspects of their normal life to follow him. So yes, they belong to him, spirit, soul, and body. However, even though they've done so much for him, a servant must still admit that he or she is worthless and has only done their duty. According to Roy Hessen, the five marks of a bond servant are this. Number one, he must be willing to have one thing on top of another put upon him without any consideration be given to him. Number two, in doing this, he must be willing not to be thanked for it. Number three, having done all this, he must not charge the master with selfishness. Number four, he must confess that he is an unprofitable servant. And number five, he must admit that doing and bearing what he has in the way of meekness and humility, he has not done one stitch more than what, his, than what was his duty to do. Now maybe some of you have felt like you've done a lot. You've been working your entire lives or you've been working this entire two years, one year, whatever it may be, you've been doing a lot for the Lord. 
You've been going places, you've been ministering to people, you've been praying with people, you've been feeding the, the homeless, you've been cleaning the church, you've been doing all kinds of things, and, and now you're starting to think that maybe you deserve uh, some kind of participation trophy. If so, this is what you've been thinking. Keep in mind that what you've done is simply what God has expected for you to do. And since this is the case, you really shouldn't be expecting to get some kind of great prize for what you do in faith. See, you need to realize that God is actually the one at work. He's only doing what you prayed for. Did you pray to get into the ministry? Did you pray to be a pastor? Did you pray to plant the church? Did you pray to be in children's ministry? or to feed the hungry, or to clean the church, or to be involved in some way for the Lord to use you. Well, if you did, again, keep in mind that He's only doing what you prayed for. So having done all you know to do, simply sit down and say to God, I am a worthless slave doing the task that you've assigned me to do. Thank you for the opportunity, and I will continue to serve you willingly, obediently, and faithfully. See, here's the thing. Faith is accepting the role of an obedient servant without expecting great gratitude and reward. Faith trusts Jesus, and so follows Jesus. Let me share with you the same words Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. In summary, verses 1 through 10 depict the life of mature faith in Christ. It's a life of forgiveness, faith, and humility. We must always remember that forgiveness is unlimited and nothing should prevent a disciple, a disciple from forgiving. When forgiveness or any other of the Lord's commands seem impossible to accomplish, increased faith isn't the answer. Faith also isn't something measured and compared to see who wins the faith tournament, the faith championship. Faith is either true or false. We also saw that the smallest amount of faith can make the impossible possible. So when it comes to forgiving others who regularly sin against you, we mustn't see it as an impossible task, but rather a normal act of faith. As followers of Jesus, we should continue to trust Him in faith and always seek to do the Father's will. Because you see, the more we do this with a sincere heart, the more natural it will become to forgive people without keeping score. So how can you have such faith and offer such forgiveness? You must live with humility, knowing your place in the stream of life. And what is that? God is master and you are his servant slaves. You shouldn't look upon a life of ongoing forgiveness as a great accomplishment. Instead, you should see it as a normal act of the life of faith. It's something that you're supposed to do. Being obedient to the Lord's commands is what Jesus expects of us. And so, as his slaves, we ought to do what He expects. If you refuse to do so, even after being told you need to, or you think that you can't do it, then perhaps you have the wrong opinion of yourselves. So be honest with yourself and consider the possibility that you think you're something greater and better than a servant. But as you come to the Lord with these issues, don't ask for increased faith. 
ask for the true faith that makes you a slave of Jesus who normally practices forgiveness as a faithful way of life. Now there's one final thing I wanted to mention about this passage that we just covered. None of this is possible without faith in God and those three components that I mentioned of faith. Those are knowledge, belief, and trust. So let me ask you, do you know Him, believe in Him, and trust Him? Now I'm not asking you if you know that God exists or that if you believe in God. I'm asking if you have all three components, all of them. If you know Him, believe in Him, and have put your trust in Him. If you can honestly say that you haven't, and you'd like to, and you finally understand that all you've been missing is that last component, and you're ready to take that step of faith to trust in God, to trust in Jesus, if that's what you're ready to do, and I want to lead you in a prayer to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, to make Him the master of your life. And if you're ready to do that, if you're ready to accept Him as your Savior, wherever you're at, bow your head and close your eyes. And if you can, you can kneel as well and repeat this prayer from the bottom of your heart, from all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose three days later. So now I turn from my sins. I repent and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, contact us. Let us know. We want to lead you in, or help you into to your next steps of faith. This new Christian life is not meant to be walked alone. Ask anyone who's tried, and they will tell you how, equally, how easily they've wandered away. So whether you're in a different state or a different country, contact us and I'll try to help you find a good Bible teaching church. I'll see what resources I can find for you in order to, to start on your journey. And remember that as a young believing Christian, as a, as a new born again Christian, it's okay to start off crawling. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a normal development of the Christian walk. Over time, you'll begin to to crawl faster, you'll begin to, to sit up, you'll begin to walk, just like a normal human child. You'll begin to run, and then you'll start teaching others to do the same. For some, it takes a long time, for others, it's quick. But God has a purpose, and we have to accept His will. He will give you what you need at any particular moment. I hope that this passage encouraged you, blessed you, has challenged you, has convicted you. I hope you see that forgiveness is important and that having just a little amount of faith, great things can be accomplished. If you have anything that you want us to pray about, message on the bottom of this video or go to our website and there you can fill out um, your, that information and, and it'll come to me. If you're here locally, come and check us out. We're a small church, but we're a small church with a big heart. And you will see that no matter who you are, what walk of life you come from, um, no matter what you've done, you will be accepted here. I'll be praying that this upcoming week will go well for you, that you'll stay healthy, you will encourage those around you and that your actions will be a testimony of what God has done in your life. 
So go out there this week. Be his disciple. Be his servant. Be his slave. And do what he commanded you, what he's commanded you to do, what he expects for you to do. And thank him every single moment that he's given you that opportunity. Again, be blessed. And I'll see you again next week. Goodbye.